Railway Conversations with Doc Frank. Railway Conversations with Doc Frank. Hello and welcome back to the show. I have two guests today. They are both from Belgium, that's in Europe. One of them was a previous guest on the podcast, Xavier Rico, and the other one is his colleague, Jean-Francois Verdun. They are both specialists on ETCS, European Train Control Systems, and particularly, as you will hear, involved with interoperability testing. So the idea of this podcast is to talk to them about the latest developments and best practices for ETCS interoperability in Europe and how the Australian railway industry can learn from that in their own pursuit of ETCS interoperability. I hope that's of interest to you, not just when you are from Australia, but also from any other country that considers the introduction of interoperable ETCS. Please enjoy. Before we start the podcast, I quickly wanted to let you know about the current Black Friday offer that I'm offering for all my training courses on my training portal docfranktraining.podia.com. All courses are 24% off because we have the year 2024. And the easy way for you to access world class signaling training at discounted prices is to go to the website docfranktraining.podia.com you look up a training course or two or three that are of interest to you and when you check out then you just apply the coupon code BF24 which stands of course for Black Friday 24 but now please enjoy my conversation with Xavier and Jean-Francois Xavier and okay. Jean-Francois, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you, Doc. Thank, thank you. you for being here. As Hello. Last time, somehow. I had thank a previous... you for inviting me. <laughs> Very welcome. I had a previous podcast interview with uh, Xavier already. Uh, which was very much about ETCS and ETCS interoperability. And because that topic has gained so much political drive here in Australia recently, I wanted to get the latest update from you, what's happening in Europe. And Xavier said, OK, Jean-Francois needs to be on the call as well, because he is one of the top experts in that area. So what I would like to do is start off with you to introducing yourselves one after the other uh, to explain to the listeners what's your role with regards to ETCS and specifically uh, ETCS interoperability. Xavier, okay, maybe so I'll start I'll, with you. Start. Yes, so, uh, so my name is Xavier Rico. Uh, I have been working uh, in, uh, in the ETCS field for about 15 years. Um, I started um, Early in the beginning, in um, by by learning uh, the ETCS domain, um, but that's more that level of detail is more uh, expressed in the other podcast, so I will not go in this uh, direction. Uh, so today I'm a head of the railway certification department and autonomous transport systems. Um, I'm representing the, the the department on the one hand uh, in the in the uh, let's say, uh, being responsible for the lab uh, certification process. Uh, on and on the other hand, being responsible for tools development, software development, um, golden references uh, development, um, digital twins, whatsoever you can ever imagine that can help and support our customer uh, in in our field. Um, and the uh, last piece of of the puzzle is, um, <coughs> is also. Uh, R&D, so that's another another field of, of topic uh, I am uh, engaged as, as responsible uh, of, the, of this department. Uh, and these three uh, hot topics, I would say, test, certification test, development, and uh, the last piece of, of the game is R&D, uh, give a lot of um, contribution to, to support uh, interoperability uh, in, my, in my field. So I give the floor to Jean-François. <laughs> Thank you, Xavier. So I'm Jean-François Verdun. So I'm working uh, with Xavier uh, at Multitel in Belgium uh, 
since uh, 2007. So I have a background of uh, electrics, electronics engineering. Uh, I started working uh, at Multitel uh, in the field of uh, railway signaling, in particular ERTMS. Um, so uh, at the beginning, we have set up uh, together with Xavier, because we were the more or less the two first people to work on the subject at, at Multitel more than 15 years ago. Uh, so we have set up a, a railway test laboratory. So I was uh, myself deeply involved in the process of getting this lab uh, accredited uh, with regards to the ISO 17025 standard. Um, so uh, I myself have, wor have worked also on the on uh, software development, image processing to to be able to to set up this lab and to make it uh, quite uh, much uh, automatized. Um, so I've been involved in the development of uh, test specification for ERTMS for the onboard uh, subsystem. And I worked a bit also on the, the development of tests for Trackside, for RBC. Um, more recently, uh, I've been involved in the collaboration with our other um, ERTMS accredited, accredited laboratories. Um, in particular, now I am the managing director of the Association of the Labs. Um, Thanks to this, uh, I have the opportunity to represent the lab uh, in uh, several forums uh, in Europe. And uh, that's why uh, I have the opportunity to talk with a, a lot of uh, stakeholders uh, for the railway uh, signaling and especially ERTMS, uh, in particular in Europe. So basically, uh, this is why I'm currently doing. Okay. Um, just for clarification for the listeners, you mentioned one ISO standard 17025 or something like that. Uh, what is the standard for? So ISO 17025 is a standard for the test laboratories. So it lists uh, uh, a long series of requirements related uh, also to the quality management system of the laboratories. Basically, it ensures that uh, a laboratory respects some rules uh, that gives you uh, a good level of uh, trust in the results of the laboratories. And it's not a railway specific, so it's, uh, it's used also in uh, in other uh, sectors, but uh, at least in Europe, it was requested by the system authority, the the, uh, the ERA, so the the EU uh, railway agency, uh, to get it uh, to get the labs accredited uh, in order to to test the onboard subsystems, and so Multitel was the first uh, lab accredited in the world for onboard test uh, test for ERTMS, uh, and it was uh, a long time ago now, I think it was in, uh, in 2011 or something like this. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of you can explain why uh, labs are so important for ETCS testing, particularly with regards to interoperability. Uh, yes, actually, uh, whatever the system you want to, to design and produce, you, you have to test it. And uh, in railways, you have the possibility to test uh, a system on site. So you take a real train, you, you place it on a real track, and uh, you perform some tests. But for sure, when you perform some tests, at least most of the time, it's not possible to do it uh, in the commercial operation. Well, you, you may add some, uh, some modules to an existing system uh, or try to retrofit an existing system. And 
there would be a possibility to to have the test done during some kind of commercial operation. But usually, when you set up a system, you do the test before. And in particular, in Europe, and in particular, for example, in, in Belgium, for us, in the center of Europe, where the network is uh, with a very high density, it's very difficult to find a slot to perform some tests on the real track. You have to perform tests uh, during the night, and uh, but during the night, you usually lots of freight trains uh, are running on the track. So even during the, the night, it's not easy. And so this is the first argument um, to go in the way to have tests in the laboratory. So and what is it is about? Basically, you take computers, for example, that we that are meant to be uh, uh, placed in the engine, on the, tr on the track or in the engine, uh, in the locomotive. And you, you, you bring them in, in the lab and you connect them to a list of computers uh, and you perform tests via a, a virtual environment. So this is the first uh, objective, let's say, it's to be free to run the test when you want, and not just when you have a, a small a small slot of time during a night, uh, because I, this costs less. This is the first argument. A I, second I, one. I, I, will, I will add something on my on this. Um, it's also a way to enforce the the capability to perform degraded mode of tests. In fact. So it's not only um, imagine that you are moving your, your, your train on, on the track and you, you would like to perform, um, let's say, degraded mode, of, degraded mode in a radio communication. You, of course, uh, it's uh, connected to the air gap and you do not necessarily have the, 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 the ability to invert uh, messages, for example. So to have a test where you are uh, sending one message with a certain time and another message with another time, but the other way around in order to determine if the, the onboard is able to reject that message. So that's one kind of uh, specific test that we can do in the lab, but you, that will never be able to ex effectively perform on the field, in fact. But there are many uh, cases and use cases like this. And one, this particularity is uh, from the lab is, is also to add on top of uh, nominal cases, degraded, uh, degraded cases, which are essential to ensure that the system is, is doing his job, in fact. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's uh, even uh, a step further than what I would have expected. I, I would have thought that um, it's probably difficult in the field to really have a comprehensive test of all the normal functions, not just a certain subset that you have on a certain piece of track, but a complete set of functions of the system. And and your argument, Xavier, about the degraded mode basically comes on top of it. That makes it even more necessary to have these tests in the lab. And and I also could imagine, and by the way, I don't want to steal Jean-Francois Thunder. He wasn't really done with his uh, number of reasons, but I could also mention that there is uh, quite a bit of time that can be gained by by having a lab uh, test where the test cases are stimulated probably in a much quicker order than what you could do in a field test with a real locomotive you can't just say ah the locomotive goes there and now it has to go back and go there again and back and there and back and yes, there and exactly. that, sure, that's just sure. just not realistic yeah yeah, if you, if you want to test, uh, well, I don't know if there is a, a railway between uh, Sydney and Melbourne, but if you, you want to, to make the test from Sydney to Melbourne, and if you want to redo the test on the field, you have to send the, the train back to, to Sydney. In the lab, you just click on the restart. And uh, so the time is... Uh, an important uh, issue and uh, with the test. Uh, you also have the possibility to automate uh, tests. And so you in the lab, you have the possibility to make 
a much more comprehensive uh, testing of the system than yes. on the field. And another, maybe the last argument I have in mind is that you are uh, saving time in the lab because uh, you are able to do tests earlier without having to set up everything on the, on the field. And so you find bugs during the lab test. And if you want to correct those bugs, it's much easier than if you discover bug at the least, later stage of the process. And uh, when it costs, it will cost you much more time and money to, to solve the issues. There are some studies that have been uh, done by uh, some uh, some our partners labs that uh, uh, well give the results of uh, the amount of money uh, you spend if you test everything of, on the field or everything on the lab or mixed solutions uh, using the lab you, you you will save money and time actually and i have another add-on <laughs> which is which is Uh, in the lab, the, the design of the scenario uh, were, were achieved in such a way that we make the test repeatable, reproducible, and without any human factor in the loop. And this is essential to ensure that we are not effectively uh, addressing the test um, without any control. And that's why ISO 17.025 is exactly there, is to have, ensure that no matter issue we find, it has to decrease in time. And last, another topic is um, if we find an issue, we can reproduce it so that the supplier can fix it. Uh, if you do this type of exercise on the field and in, and you, for an, for an unknown reason, you missed an icon or the icon was acknowledged automatically. One basic example we had recently, uh, you, you, will, you will probably even not necessarily backlog this, this issue effectively, efficiently, where compared to the lab environment where you, you can effectively uh, focus on, 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 on specific uh, use cases, reproduce it and show to the supplier that there is a, a, an issue there. And sometimes it's not even a supplier issue, neither. It can be the TSI issue as well. Uh, something like a gray area in the TSI. That was the experience we had in the early beginning in baseline two and which was enhanced from time to time to ensure that we were not having such uh, issues repeated again because it was not as it was as gray as it was in the past and it is as black and white nowadays with the baseline 3 and and later on the uh, baseline 4 which is uh, coming in fact you you just gave me a segue Xavier into something that i wanted to discuss at the very beginning of the discussion but then we we delved into that lab Uh, topic and and I will come back to labs as well because I've got a couple of questions there as well but um, I I tend to say that one of the biggest mistakes that people make with ETCS is assuming that they get interoperability by default and mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I see this quite often here in Australia and you can say okay well Australia that's far away from Europe and they 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 make assumptions they they think that everything is okay in Europe and interoperability is just there. Um, I wanted to get a quick impression from you or um, like your experience in Europe with regards to ETCS interoperability. Is it really that easy or is it much more complicated than the railway thought? Um, how, how difficult do you see the achievement of ETCS interoperability in the past, I'm talking maybe five to 10 years ago. Uh, it, it's not easy for sure. So uh, for sure, uh, e ETCS is not, uh, let's say, uh, interoperable by design because uh, there are s several reasons. Um, uh, I think that the most important reason is the, the fact it's, uh, it's complex, it's a complex system. And, uh, well, <clears throat> it has been designed 
in the in the let's say in the 90s the the, the first works uh, were done in the 19s uh, first specs were available in the late 90s so i wasn't not yet working on the subject at the time uh, not yet working at all i would say <laughs> as I was a bit too young, but um, the impression I, I get is that, is that uh, you know, European Union is a democratic entity. So it's a, it's a very good thing because it's attractive because you are, uh, you are never, you, you never feel oppressed, I would say, because when you want to say something, you have the right to say it. And it's it's really good, and everybody share uh, the feelings and uh, uh, opinions, and f it's the same for ETCS. So I, I guess at the beginning, well, I, I know a bit the story. So uh, suppliers, operators, uh, railway stakeholders gathered. There were some uh, a list of uh, working groups to try to, to design the first specifications. But when you look at the specifications, at least the feeling I have is, is that it's too, too much complex. Uh, you can see that there are several technological solutions uh, defined for the same problem. And probably, I, I guess it was, well, one country or one company, one supplier, one operator, or whatever, needed to keep one solution uh, because probably they had invested a lot of money in this solution. And so they fought to, uh, to keep the solution in the, in the ETCS system. And there was a discussion and uh, negotiations, and at the end, uh, in the system, there are several solutions to the same problem. And this leads to a, a specification that is complex. And for me, it's really the, the original sin, I would say. I think it would have been better to uh, uh, maybe to say to one country, one uh, big company, one operator, I don't know, but well, okay, we understand you you have invested a lot of money on this solution. And we understand if in ETCS this solution is not included, you will lose a lot of money. And maybe your company is not, has no, uh, let's say, has not the, the technology. So is not able to sell such technology. And I think, uh, I don't know if it's feasible, but at least it's easier for me to say it, but I think the best solution, a better solution would have been to say, okay, we understand you have invested money, you are going to lose money because your solution would not be chosen. Let's do a, some trade and okay, maybe we will, the, the EU will provide you money for you to be able to invest in your country or in the technology deployment. Because here, this was not done this way, I think. And uh, in the end, it led to a co complex system. And this is, and a complex system is not uh, easy to make interoperable. And I think this is uh, one of the biggest problems of ETCS. Yes, but at the same time, I would argue that this was the basis on which the specifications of ETCS could be done in the first place. I, I, I understand your, your rationale for simplifying it and basically cutting off some, some parts, certain ways to do things from certain countries. But hey, if, if you work in the railway of that country and you are the one where functions are getting cut back, you would be the first one saying, no, 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 that, that doesn't work like this. And and if I, if I can draw a bridge here over to Australia and the situation here, if I compare the, the signaling systems in the three biggest cities along the East Coast in uh, Melbourne and Sydney and in Brisbane, if, if anybody went to Brisbane and says, well, 
for the sake of interoperability, your signaling system needs to be changed that it looks exactly like the system in Sydney, they would say over my dead body. They, they would just not do it and vice versa. So it's not, not to, to say anything against Brisbane. The same would happen in Sydney if you would say, OK, the signaling system in Sydney in the future needs to behave like the system in Brisbane or in Melbourne. So there's, there's a lot of history behind that. There's a lot of uh, philosophical um, determination I would say behind it so so every system every railway would would have very good reasons not not just believes that their system is the best but they will bring very good reasons why their system is exactly the way it is and this is how it needs to be replicated in ETCS and I think this this is what has happened where I see a big risk is uh, not so much in Europe. I mean, the, the ETCS in Belgium will look very strongly like the previous signaling system in Belgium. And ETCS in Germany will have very many aspects of the previous signaling system, the old signaling system in Germany, which is still there in, in large parts of the country. I think the, the big risk is if you go outside Europe to a railway um, which which takes this this complex toolbox of ETCS and then they pick one feature which was previously implemented from Poland and then they have another feature from Italy and they try to bring <coughs> this together and the end result is a catastrophe. It's, it's possible in theory, but in practice, um, no supplier has ever done anything like that. And that's where you really get into into interoperability problems, which are arguably bigger than than what you can ever have in in Europe. Yeah, but but what what I think is important here is your confirmation that interoperability in in Europe, even in Europe, where it was a key requirement for the development of ETCS, it doesn't come automatically. It does require work, and. And now we're basically coming back to the kind of work that is required to get to interoperability. And uh, in, 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 my, in my definition or in my, in my uh, system of thought, there are two things required. One is at the definition stage, you have to define your solution, what it does, your functionality. And, and that functionality must be clear both for the track side and for the the onboard system so that the onboard system knows what's required from for the ETCS system to operate on a certain railway and then the second aspect is the testing so once suppliers know what they need to do and they go back and and develop it into their products and then they come back and then there needs to be a checking whether those functions have really been implemented and this is i believe where testing comes in is that kind of how you see it as well or have i simplified it too much uh no i think you're right uh, it's uh really uh, very important to to, to to perform tests for sure uh the company that uh, developed a product will perform tests and uh, those tests, uh, they do it uh, with, uh, I think, uh, much involvement. Yeah. And uh, but the thing is that we are not on a simple system, so uh, it's not easy to perform a, a comprehensive test of the system. And uh, for sure, we as an, uh, an independent test laboratory, we are in favor of additional independent tests. But even without this, we, we think it's very important to have a additional independent test of the system because this is a system, a complex system, and uh, the potential consequence of uh, uh, a failure or a bad behavior of the system could be uh, uh, could lead to some complicated situation. I would say so. Uh, we are really in favor of 
testing uh, even much more than the, what is done currently, uh, I would say. So it's really important, the test. I so, agree. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, Doc. No, no. I want to add a, a bit of um, of a case uh, in this uh, word, wording from Jean-François. Uh, there was an issue um, in the Olympic Games uh, uh, in South Korea when they deployed the, their line. Uh, it was ETCS at that point in time. Uh, and uh, there was uh, an accident. Um, the, the driver uh, went uh, paralyzed uh, for for ages. Um, and the, the the root cause of this uh, case, uh, I know because I, I talk a lot with the the customers there in, in South Korea, was mostly coming from the fact that um, um, the, there was a, a lot of pressure to deliver for for the Op Olympic Games. Uh, to have this line ready for that that period, well, that's one that was one thing, and the second thing, at uh, when you have so much pressure, at certain point in time, you you need to cut uh, um, some some phases in in, the, in your process, and that was ha what that was what happened there. They cut the 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 test phase, the taste phase, they made it shorter. And um, and at the end of the of the game, uh, there was there was a, a damage uh, on people. In fact, yeah, 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 yeah. Because testing comes so late in the in the process in the in the project yes. delivery process. Uh, when when time runs out towards the end of the project, testing is one of the activities that that is always cut shorter. So, and and <coughs> it becomes it becomes a problem. Obviously, if that. Uh, cutting the time shorter goes at the expense of quality of the testing quality exactly. so so that that's why it's so important and i think this is where the lab testing comes back in if it gives you the opportunity to compress your testing periods so that you say okay even if we only have a relatively compressed amount of time we can still make sure that either we can do a comprehensive test or at least we know which test cases we need to prioritize because they could lead to an accident and mm -hmm. and make sure that at least those prioritized test cases are being conducted without without any compromise yeah and mm -hmm. and uh, that that's probably also what you previously mentioned to take the human factor out of the testing um, that that you it, it's not it's not down to one person or two persons to decide which test cases to cut out, uh, but there there is some kind of uh, objective, in lack of a better word, objective prioritization of test cases where you say, well, this number of test cases must be done under any circumstance, otherwise there's a risk that the system is not safe, right? Mandatory. Mandatory, I would say. Yes, 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 yes. Um, coming back to the whole term subject of uh, of lab tests, the previous question that I had, but then I came the, uh, um, to talk about the interoperability generics in the first place. How do you make sure that a lab test is comprehensive? So what what uh, how do you make sure that you really covered all of the test cases and uh, I mean, even even a lab test needs to be designed, right? So, so you need to design <laughs> the test cases in. How do you make sure that you don't forget anything? Well, um, for the well, it may be applied to uh, other other uh, device on the test, but uh, for example, or related to the onboard equipment in ETCS. So the basic document of uh, ETCS for the uh, is the system requirement specification, also known as subset 26. Uh, so uh, to test the, the onboard equipment uh, with the use of, of tools that some of them uh, we have developed ourselves. So we, we list all the requirements of subset 26. And um, well, in the past, we as lab uh, were analyzing uh, 
which clauses were requirements or not, because there are some informative clauses, but which were on board or track side requirements or both. But now it is a, a, a job that is under the responsibility of the system authority, so the, the DERA. Uh, but so as a laboratory, we have as input a list of onboard testable requirements. And uh, for each requirement, we design uh, a test case that will prove uh, that the, the equipment uh, is compliant to, to the requirement. But it's, it's not, uh, let's say, um, an easy task because uh, some requirements are simple, but some are complex with several uh, sentences because it is a natural language so subject to interpretation and uh, also we must admit that we cannot test ev everything so when we say we test the onboard equipment it's always to be understood as a as a sample of all the possible situation that could occur but as a uh, relatively comprehensive uh, sample, let's say. Because even using automation, even using the laboratory, uh, it's not affordable to test every combination of all the situations. But we... we because we do black box testing principle in this context. It's, uh, we are not allowed to go inside the box to test it. Uh, that's what we would call it a white box test. Uh, and when we do this such black box testing principle, we, we are, uh, let's say, stimulating the, the, the system to, to determine its uh, inherent reaction and if it reacts properly according to what we were expecting. And these series of stimulation, we have to classify it according to the interfaces that, that are surrounding the, the onboard unit. Uh, so if it's coming from the DMI, from the display, or from the odometry input, or from uh, the balis, the euro balis, the transponder that sends data to the to the train, uh, or from the radio, uh, and so on and so on. So all these uh, interfaces surrounding the onboard, we we need to uh, adequately classify it uh, and and link all these uh, set of test steps to what we would we would call um based on requirement uh, notion so um so we, we we will classify a set of 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 of, of test steps which are composed composing a use case a test case we will link it to a, a set of requirements uh, which are uh, uh, located into the subset 26 and this simple test case uh, afterwards uh, is is not enough it's just what we will we have we have ha as a plan to test the onboard the system but it is not enough why because uh, when this test case is installed is de deployed into a scenario a test sequence it's another stage of the design process we will assemble this set of of test cases one after the other uh, in order to ensure that it is smoothly um, uh, following the process of, of the operational means of, of the of the of the system, in fact, to make a, a basic example, we have a test case where we do a start of mission in level one staff responsible, but just to for for staff a start of mission in level one staff responsible, uh, we we have um, a series of of test cases which are uh, there to say okay you you are entering the train ring number and it is correctly displayed. And so on and so on. Uh, then another test case uh, appear, which is following the procedure of the start <laughs> of mission, which is part of another chapter in the standard, uh, chapter the chapter five, uh, and, and so on and so on. And all these set of test cases are then tuned according to a series a specific data content that will stimulate the system as a black box, and this black box testing principle is not enough is not enough 
to to make a full comprehensive uh, test because the we 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 can't as an accredited lab put a probe into the system we are testing we are making this test as as if we were inside the train as if we were uh, using the device under test the, the the onboard as as a black box in fact that that's why there is a, a list uh, i would say a reduced list uh, a small list of requirements that we are not able to test in the laboratory with the black black box principle and with the available interfaces but it's a really small amount of the requirements the other requirements they are we test them and we ensure the the traceability is really uh, fundamental in our process so we really start from the requirement and we trace all the process to the the validation of the test during the, the, the simulation in the laboratory. And when we perform a test campaign at the end, we know all the, the, the requirements that were uh, okay and all the requirements that uh, were not okay for which the, 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 the product was not compliant. Uh, but as I say, it's a bit of... Uh, uh, for there are yes or no situation. So here, the test is exhaustive, but there are really situation in which uh, we have to to perform sampling. What what I understood from what you just said is that this is kind of a generic test of the onboard subsystem. Um, what, what what I think is it's uh, relevant for <coughs> interoperability that that I have a certain trackside application of ETCS in a certain country or on a certain railway line and uh, then maybe another application somewhere else maybe on the other side of the border if we're talking two different countries with a border in between and then the onboard system in order to be interoperable needs to be able to operate on on both of these ETCS trackside applications so what I would, and, and the trackside application generally implement the signaling principles of the respective countries. It's, it's normally, it's even worse than that. This, this was just assuming that we have one set of ETCS trackside systems for say Belgium and one set for France. And it's not like this. There are examples in Europe and Netherlands is a classic where you had the first three ETCS applications in the Netherlands, uh, HSL Sausen high speed line, uh, the BTW route, which is a freight line. And the third one was Amsterdam to Utrecht. They were all done at different points in time to different versions of the ETCS standards and with very different operational requirements. I mean, obviously a, a freight line and the high speed passenger line are very, very different when it comes to operational requirements. As a consequence, you couldn't really say we have one set of uh, Dutch ETCS track site requirements, but we had three different projects and they were all different. And now they, mm -hmm. they basically need to backpedal to bring them all somewhat together. But let's just assume that we have uh, a situation with two countries, a border in between. You want to travel from one country to the other. Let's take the example Belgium to Netherlands, for example, which I think was one of the first uh, cross-border interoperability examples in Europe. Austria-Hungary was another one that was level one. Um, so <coughs> do you do you use um, something like a trackside test bench where you say, okay, this behaves like the trackside system in Belgium, this behaves like the trackside system in the Netherlands, and now we take those two test benches and test the onboard system for both of these test benches. Is this is how it works? Or if if not, can you let us know how it works otherwise? Well, there, there is a several step approach. Uh, in the first step, the subsystem, so the, the track side uh, in uh, Belgium, for example, is tested. Uh, can be tested via a, a trackside test bench. And each trackside may be tested separately. 
So this is the first step and the onboard may be tested separately, but as a second step, uh, we, we may perform a, a test at, at the system level involving onboard and track side, um, uh, performing scenario, test scenarios uh, dedicated to, to this, uh, this particular track side systems and the, 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 the cross-border situation uh, itself. So it's rather a system level uh, test that so, we okay. perform at a system level test bench. Yes, so and in this context, um, um, to make uh, also a bit of emphasis on that, we, we designed um, a track side test bench um, in the, and, uh, to effectively assess, uh, witness the, 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 the track side in isolated mode. Um, so it's equivalent process that we have for the onboard. So for the onboard, it's subset 76, <coughs> the, the, the so-called subset 76 uh, test scenario. And for the, for the wayside track side, we have designed on a voluntary base uh, what we call subset RBC to, to test the RBC in isolated mode. So that's, that's, that, that this said, um, it's to prepare the devices to be ready for the system level test. So it's uh, the, the next stage of the process. And in this process, we you just make it, we make make it very simple. So the the, the onboard part is like a a, a, play, a playback. So it's a, we are we click on the button play in our lab. The the wayside the track side for the RBC it's the same story. We click on the button play to it's a, we call it message player based testing. So we everything is fixed. There is no dynamic between the in the process. Uh, and then we, when we go to the stage of, of the system level, we, pre, we press on the record button. And when we press on the record button, we have no more influence on the process except the way the, the driver acts on the train, we're using a robot in our case, and the way the signaler acts on the, on the track side to set the route to, and so on and so on. And we also simulate this part by using a specific protocols to address these targets uh, <coughs> to track side. Um, at the end of the, of the game, we design the track layout as similar, as close as real wayside. Uh, so it's um, in the case of UK, we had this experience with the UK with network trail. Uh, the, they, they have what they, they call the net lab there. Um, we designed the Great Britain reference design scenario. That's a generic approach for, for system level test. Uh, but we did this, the, another exercise, the exercise for South Korea, their pilot line, Geola line, uh, 180 kilometer length, um, 25 interlocking systems, three RBCs, two EVCs. Um, all, all in one, and in this system level test bench, we what we did, we designed the, the we redesigned, we we transposed the, the design of the field into the lab, and we used a set series of format to you to to uh, to ensure that we were as aligned as the field, and uh, uh, in this context again, uh, they have always pressure in delivery. <laughs> They they were changing the the design in the in the process and in the lab we had to follow and redesign again and again and again. But at the end of the game, we had a, what we call a reference network, which was representing a reference line, if you prefer, which represents all the stations, all the the point machines, or everything which an interlocking will have to to play with, uh, and that's one thing. And then we just, it's a very simple to say just, but we put any train anywhere and we, we click on, on record and, and the train is doing his job. We will no more uh, add any extra, uh, let's say, uh, scenario stimulation in this process. We will just leave the train follow its route. And when it pass over a balise, it, the balise will automatically send the, the, the message it, was, it is meant to send to that train at that place in the, in the system. 
So it's an easier process, <laughs> I would say, to perform system level tests than, than uh, component tests. When we test the, the system subsystems in isolated mode, it's very easier system. But uh, the, the key in, in this case is to have the best, uh, mo the most realistic representation of the signaling schemes in the lab. And uh, to, to, to take back to your example, <coughs> we, uh, we to have the say as close as possible the line on from France French part and to be to have the, the line as close as possible from the Belgian part and to to make the train move over, <coughs> it's, it's very easy in the end because for us it's just to have the data <laughs> um, uh, which is the key in this case. And in the end you the system will just follow its process uh, smoothly. And and do, do the job. But we will need to add extra event from the from the onboard side, which will where we will play the role of the of the perfect driver, I would say. But uh, and on the other side, we will play the role of the of the perfect signal. Uh, but we as we have also the the possibility to degrade that part as well. It's a matter of uh, use case choices and determine whenever we want to see a specific reaction out of the system which is under test in this context. Yeah. Be before we come to the situation in Australia, and I want to give you a bit of a challenge there, um, is there anything happening in Europe at the moment that tries to make it easier to become interoperable? I think uh, to give you a bit of a point, I, I think, Xavier, we had a bit of a pre-discussion a few weeks back uh, where I understood, I understood you said something like uh, ERA is now trying to establish at least two onboard suppliers for every ETCS application. I'm, I'm not sure whether you can um, recall that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Are, there, are there any things in Europe happening uh, which are kind of best practice to make it as to facilitate interoperability the best yeah, way that that's yeah. possible uh, let me add yeah. one thing before uh, jean francois and then you you talk okay oh. uh, just to answer the the feedback we had when we discussed last time in fact effectively so the tsi the last tsi uh, expectations from which was now published uh, and official, which is now official, uh, expect uh, from any um, tracks, uh, let's say system level test to be performed, or to, sorry, track side validation process to have at least two different onboard suppliers <coughs> uh, and one track side under test. So that's the what is written in the stone, in the in the law, I would say, to validate the track side, the, to have it validated, certified, I would say, the TSI expects at least two on board from two different suppliers and one track side to be, let's say, uh, assessed, in fact. So that's a kind of key uh, topic uh, nowadays. Uh, and uh, I give, I will give uh, the, the word to Jean Francois. So, so but, but I want ju just a second, that. just just for clarification. So, so if if I if I have a railway which is basically starting from scratch, trying to do as much as possible to ensure that the solution, the outcome, will provide interoperability, is it fair to say that the best practice is to start? with two onboard suppliers right from the get-go in yes. order to create this triangle of the two yeah, onboard exactly. suppliers and the one track side suppliers is that yes. a correct yes. interpretation yes exactly that's okay. what is re today written in the tsi yeah and and i i, I well i may give a, an example close to to my hometown in belgium so uh, they installed a uh, tram recently and there was a first line and uh, so uh, that is nearly ready and the pub public service wanted to extend the network and well it's not etcs so it's a different topic 
but now they abandoned the extension because it was too uh, uh, too expensive uh, because there was a, there was a negotiation and the the problem was well you can go to another supplier but it will not be uh, interoperable probably so it will be difficult so yeah it's it's important to to think interoperability from the beginning and to to confront uh, uh, several suppliers uh, but coming back to the <clears throat> let's say the test approach uh, especially for a, a country as australia that is a, a continent actually uh, I, I i think it's even worth having a, a three step approach so the, the first is the component or subsystem test. You need to test every component so on board, uh, separate from the track side, and to, to check that uh, those components are compliant to the specifications. But uh, I think that for Australia, a similar approach as uh, the UK has taken is worse because with the mm -hmm. size of the, of the country, uh, it's worth having a reference design for the whole country, uh, yes. I think, because uh, if you do not do it, you will build probably one line in a part of the country, one line in another one. And with the size of the country, it will take uh, years and years. And systems will evolve and Probably you will enter into interoperability problems when you want yes. to interact. So the reference design is the key, was the key in the UK, and and just to let you just to let you know because it's quite recent on our side, uh, Korea is also doing the same game. They they are designing Korean reference design because they they somehow follow the process of UK. Uh, they identify that this pattern is really the key. Uh, so um, to have engineering rules, uh, let's say, um, let's say that are clearly specified from from the beginning, in fact, uh, and so that all everybody must obey these engineering rules. And in this con in a, in this context, the lab is is just serving the purpose of testing <laughs> by using a, a virtual representation of all p p p possible use cases. Uh, uh, that 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 will appear in these engineering rules, uh, and and after this process, I think um, another stage of uh, the first stage, that, the third stage that maybe Jean Francois has not yet uh, given is to do this exercise over the real line, which is virtualized in the lab, and which we we which is uh, achieved uh, um, after after this this reference design assessment in fact yeah and doing that's sorry i i have i have some doubts that it would work like this in in australia the 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 issue is we have in australia is that the uh we have we have railway systems like suburban railways passenger railways mostly in our big cities we have one in brisbane one in sydney one in melbourne and they are pretty independent from each other. So there is not never that a suburban train from Sydney would operate in Melbourne. That that's because it's a different it's a different rail gauge and all, all kinds of reasons, different electrification, what have you. So so we have our city systems, and then we have uh, railways that operate between the cities. Yeah, and and one of those networks is what we call the interstate network, which is predominantly for for freight. Now, the, the interstate network has very, very different operational requirements than the city networks. So what the, the problem that I would see with the reference design is to find a common denominator for two types of railways which have very different operational requirements. And that may be different in Europe, but I give you an example from the UK, since you mentioned the UK as a, as a model for reference design. The very first ETCS in the UK, as you know, was on the Cambrian, uh, on the Cambrian coastline. 
And, and the second ETCS in the UK was Thameslink in London, which is a very, very busy line, very high traffic frequency, high capacity, what have you. So if you try to bring those two things together into one reference design, you can already see the problem that's coming up. <coughs> Thameslink, Thameslink will say, we have to have our high capacity signaling because we are in the middle of London. This is what we need. We cannot do without. So they, you will have a full-blown ETCS with a radio system without any gaps in the radio coverage, anything like this. So if, if this is your baseline, your reference design, and you take this baseline design to the Cambrian coastline or some other regional line, they will say, we cannot implement this because it's an overkill. That's we, we don't need this on the Cambrian coastline. You've got long radio gaps in between just by one means of example. So, and, and that's a similar problem that I see in Australia. So having a joint reference design where all the different railways fit in, not just from the different philosophies like Brisbane being different from Sydney, being different from Melbourne, but also with the differences between those suburban rail systems and the interstate system. I, I, I struggle to see how, it, how this would work. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying per se it's impossible, but you can see the problems there, I guess. Yeah, but uh, you can imagine a reference design at the level of the country, but that could uh, be in some ways specific to the application. So freight or uh, intercity uh, or suburban. Mm -hmm. And this is why they are uh, discussing uh, currently in the EU. So you, you may know in the past, uh, there has been uh, some uh, cherry picking behavior in the functionality uh, in ETCS with uh, some, uh, some implementation. Uh, well, you know that uh, no, no train is implementing fully ETCS and there is a, a cherry picking behavior uh, by the supplier, but the, the, the Coming, the commission and the agency said that, uh, well, the cherry picking, it is finished, but uh, what is uh, acceptable would be to, to have specific uh, functionalities depending on the application. So you would have uh, a core functionality core to railways, but specific uh, functionality for the freight and specific uh, for may maybe uh, uh, passenger passenger trains. <clears throat> and you, you can have the same, you can have uh, at the level of the country a reference design that allows you to test uh, passenger trains uh, functionalities at the system level, so with the, uh, both trackside and on board, and a different set of tests still at the national level for, uh, for suburban or freight trains, because uh, I mean, suburban, it's still the same functionality, either it is in Sydney or Perth or Melbourne, it's still tra transporting passengers, close to a city and you need the same functionality. So I, I at least think this is a, 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 this might be a good approach, but now I don't know all the specifics. I, I, I will add something okay. again uh, okay. on my side. Sorry, Jack. Uh, uh, the case you, you mentioned in, in the UK were the, the cases that brought lessons learned to, to the network rail ecosystem. They, they, they learned from Tamil's link, their, their, the, the, the ma major uh, issues they could find there. They learned <coughs> from, from uh, Cambrian line, the major issues they could find there. And they, they designed the GB reference design based on these lessons learned. So uh, just to give you a bit of what you were mentioning, instead of taking 
of coming from Cambria line and do uh, try to make GB reference design out of it. They 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 made uh, uh, they made everything from scratch. In fact, they just say, say they just considered at country level at the whole country level for their global deployment uh, in the UK. What what did we learn in this in this testing in this testing phase? What did we learn in this deployment phase? And from these lessons learned, they say, okay, we will not do that this way or this other way. We will make something totally different that will pave the way as as a reference for the global system. Okay, but what 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 about the the backwards compatibility of the systems that already exist, such as Thameslink, for example? So if you now have a deviation between the Thameslink <coughs> application and the uh, GB reference design, what what happens then? Do you do you want to retrofit Thameslink with the reference design, which means a major change, or do you just leave it as it is? Uh... To be to be fair with you, I can ask the question to to the person in charge in Network Rail, and he will tell me what he has in mind in this aspect. and And if you want, I can come back to you and explain yeah. what I he mean, said to me. Then. The the reason why I'm asking this question, and I, I thought you might have an answer, but but if you don't, it's not that much of a problem. I I obviously have the the challenge in Australia in the back of my head, and so so I said I would give you a challenge or explain a situation and then I said how would you solve that so at the moment we have uh, two cities which have already implemented well three actually which have already implemented ETCS so we have an ETCS level one in Adelaide um, we have an ETCS level two which is currently being brought into service in Brisbane and in Sydney we have both an ETCS level one and also an ETCS level two. So those systems exist already, some of them for many years. Adelaide, I think, is now in service for like seven years or something like that, if not longer. Mm -hmm. And in changing those systems in retrospect will be difficult. And those systems, those applications will be different. How much different, I can't tell, but they will be different. So. If now there's a requirement to make everything of Australia interoperable <coughs> on the basis of ETCS, and somebody mm -hmm. would somebody in Australia would approach Multitel and say, you have lots of experience in interoperability testing, subsystem testing for trackside for onboard, system testing, scenario testing, what what have you. How would you do that? So, so what what would you do? How would you approach something like this? I just gave you the the, the existing yeah, framework. There are other railway applications which will probably be ETCS at the end of the day. Melbourne, for example, the interstate network, for example, but they haven't started yet. So, so they there are still some some green uh, some green slate where you can build something. But with regards to existing applications in Brisbane and Sydney. How would you approach interoperability? How can you make sure that the long-term outcome in Australia will be interoperable? Well, uh, a system that has been introduced in Europe is the, the mandatory implementation of the correction of the errors in the system. So uh, now, the on board, from, from now on, the onboard are obliged to implement uh, the error corrections with some delays and uh, with some transition period. And so it's the, the onboard must be seen as a, like a software updating uh, from time to time to, 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 to correct software. itself, but without necessarily mm -hmm. introducing a new uh, features. Uh, uh, new features, yeah, uh, and uh, but this is how, how, how it, it's uh, foreseen. But the, the railway remains, uh, so the, the track side, I mean, does not need to, to upgrade. No. So yes. even uh -huh. with a baseline four on board, you are still able to run on the baseline two track. So yes. if you have in set up your baseline two track in uh, 
let's say Melbourne, in 10 years uh, or 20 years, uh, a baseline for train will still be able to yes. run on it. With less features, for sure, yes. but it will be uh, uh, operational. We, we were almost on the same track on that. And uh, I, if you remember, uh, Jean-François, we, when we were at uh, the ERA uh, workshop last time, they mentioned a, a use case in, uh, in Switzerland, I think, um, which was a level one hybrid or level two hybrid. I, I think it was level one hybrid. They, they considered this as a way to, to make a smooth transition to, to avoid adapting, changing the wayside but still keeping um, uh, incrementally introducing the uh, radio communication in the in the process in fact um, and and um, the oh, the major the major focus is on the onboard side in fact because it must be uh, the best the best uh, system uh, that you get uh, from from the onboard is a system which is able to talk any language and to that which is able to adapt to any track side. That's why the, the European Railway Agency pushed a lot 10 years ago. This as a, re, a major requirement. All suppliers must be fully compatible with the full subset, blah, blah, blah. The problem at that point in time that was that some suppliers, they were not able to follow this guideline, this, the, this rule, because they had designed from a long time ago a system which was not able to adopt all features in, in, in the system, in fact, because it, by design, it was um, a SIL4. They needed to replace their SIL4 device to buy another one. It was, again, investing a lot of money to do that. So they prefer to keep being just compatible with the line they were they deployed <laughs> and pay fine to the European Commission. <laughs> To, to keep their, their certification process aligned because um, uh, it was the, 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 the life of some suppliers in Europe, they, they were just uh, not fully compatible, but just compatible for this piece of line. And that, that, was, what, that, that was fine. But the, this, this push from the, from the European Railway Agency was, was adequate to my point of view. Uh, we observed from in some suppliers, we, we have integrated 25 different onboard suppliers in our lab. So we have a, a good eye on what is the best candidate and the worst candidate. But what we what we saw is um, when it comes to um, to be fully compatible, some some suppliers prefer to make what we call delta test. Uh, because they, their system is not able to as, adopt the whole set, in fact. So they, they just, they, then they come to the lab and say, we want just scenario 7, 8, 100, one, uh, and so on, uh, as, as under test. So we say, okay, we test, we test. And we do this uh, basic exercise because we automate the, the record in our lab to, to record all, <laughs> but not only this scenario, but all. And when we look, when we cherry pick this uh, black part where that the, the supplier has not selected, but, but just the 10 scenario to, to, to have a certificate on their 10 scenario, we clearly see that the system is not doing the job. But so it's, it's, so it's, to, it's to, live. To, to just in, interpret or, or just, just translate what you just said. So. So firstly, I believe what, what's necessary is that the subsystems, trackside and onboard are compliant to ETCS standards, to the specifications, to subset 26. So that, that means that for, for every trackside application in Australia, so we will have one in Sydney and fingers crossed, it will be the same for all of Sydney. So I could see a reference design for ETCS level two in Sydney which is mandatory for all the lines in the Sydney network. So at least you wouldn't have any differences inside the city because then obviously you've got a problem. Same for Brisbane, you've got a reference design for Brisbane, you've got one for Sydney and in the future you will have one for the interstate network, right? Which is more freight and, and basically takes into account all the specific operational requirements for freight traffic and, and, and so on. So. 
you've got to test that those reference designs, those track site applications are compliant with ETCS standards. Because if they are not, then the onboard system has no chance. Yeah, even if the onboard um, system is perfect, if it faces a non-compliant track site subsystem, there will be interoperability issues. So yeah, once you once so that's step number one, I think. Once you have established that all your track site applications are compliant with the standard, you then need an onboard system that can work with all these track site systems mm -hmm. on which it is supposed to operate. Right? Yes. So Yes. A suburban train in Sydney will never ever operate on the suburban network in Melbourne. So that means the onboard system that only works on the suburban trains in Sydney yeah. needs to work with the trackside system in Sydney, but not with the trackside system in Melbourne. However, if you have a train or a locomotive that is required to travel between Sydney and Melbourne or between Sydney and Brisbane, then that onboard system needs to com, uh, needs to work with both the reference design in Sydney and the reference design in Brisbane. And the biggest requirement or the most comprehensive requirement is probably for the onboard system of the interstate network, because the interstate network has interfaces to all different city systems. So you've got freight trains, interstate freight trains running into Melbourne, running into Sydney, running into Brisbane, running into Perth. So, but still, this onboard system doesn't need to do everything in the ETCS standard. It just needs to be able to do everything that's in the reference designs for the interstate <coughs> network, for the Sydney network, for the Brisbane network. Is, is that is that kind of correct, correctly interpreted? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, but. <laughs> but. Uh, I understand that a uh, suburban train that uh, stays in one town uh, don't have to respect some requirements from another town. Uh, but I'm still convinced Basically, they do the same job. So if you reinvent the wheel in the second town, you may lose money. And uh, probably there are some uh, possibilities to harmonize between the towns. Because in, in Europe, so as explained earlier, ETCS is not, uh, let's say, uh, directly interoperable by itself. So you have to perform tests. And uh, in, U in Europe, each country has some national test. And in some countries, you have tests for some regions and other tests for other regions. And so the, the, the European agency has uh, requested the, all the member states to, to provide uh, ETCS system compatibility test uh, spe uh, specifications. So these are the tests that uh, one particular country uh, requests because he thinks that uh, in his country, uh, a train is a bit different than in the other countries. And uh, so those, all those tests are, are published on the website of the European uh, uh, Union Agency for Railways. And... Uh, when uh, this is quite uh, recent, uh, I, a few years ago maybe, and when you look at all those tests, you realize that there is a lot of a lot in common actually. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe sometimes the names are different, but the functionality remains. So I think there is much to win to to try to harmonize and to maybe money to save uh, uh, because uh, simply uh, people in one country are not aware of what the other countries does do, but they are doing the same, actually. Mm. Uh, and, and so yeah. there, there, there is a tendency to try to, to reduce specific yes. tests 
and for sure it cannot be achieved uh, from one day to to the other yes. but uh, there is a tendency to reduce uh, those, those tests yes. and uh, maybe in australia it might be the same at least now in europe they realize ah oh, well but uh, you are doing this test but it's already done uh, earlier or it's not a specific test it's done everywhere so please do not retest the same thing mm -hmm. And one uh, again on my side, I, I want to add one thing: the, the 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 operational scenario that are published uh, on the ERA website on the ESC test ETCS system compatibility <coughs> framework. They were published by each country uh, because it was requested by law, uh, and um, in this in this area, we saw clearly that. Uh, Class B remains um, uh, still present in in the each in each ecosystem, and class B remains still a problem <laughs> from 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 the from the purpose of ETCS. I would say because um, it's in, it, it's uh, it takes time to to remove this part. Yeah, uh, it class, was, it's, uh, class class B for the listeners that should know are the legacy systems for automatic train protection in the respective for European countries. We, we don't have that much of, uh, we don't have such a problem in Australia, at least not as far as I can see, it's not that that urgent. But I, I would, uh, and I think Jean-Francois mentioned it earlier, that Australia is more a continent than a country when you try to compare it with Europe. So, so I would see the different rail networks as almost equivalent to the different countries in Europe. So I would consider Sydney and New South Wales being a country in Australia or a state, mm -hmm. as we call it. I and agree. Brisbane and South East Queensland would be a state and Melbourne, Victoria would be one. And the interstate network is almost like a, a state in itself as well. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's, it's 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 kind of comparable to to Germany, which sits smack bang in the middle of Europe, and the trains are going into all those other different countries. They're going to Poland, to Denmark, to Netherlands, to France, to Austria, and and so on. So they have all these different interfaces to all the other different countries. So so if you if you have if you have compatibility tests requirements from all those different countries i think that's a very realistic uh, scenario because sydney would want to make sure that any onboard system traveling into the sydney network complies with the requirements from sydney so so i yes. i think that's that's a perfect scenario that's very transferable into australia and um, i would like to, to add a, a bit of more on, on that as well uh, we could even consider the 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 Sydney uh, um, suburban uh, uh, topic as a, as a kind of class B system, uh, and the uh, just 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 not say that that it is a class B, but imagine that you have a very specific functionality which is just specific to I don't know Brisbane or what what whatsoever, which is for example. Uh, GPS um, uh, with uh, uh, driverless positioning uh, uh, <coughs> module, which is not anywhere else. <laughs> no, I would, um, no, 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 no. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think the the difference are that severe that we have. I so, see. so, so Sydney and Brisbane are talking to each other. They've been talking to each other for a while with with the aim to come up with with something that will allow for interoperability in the future. Okay. So they're, okay. they're, they both have ETCS level two, they both have uh, GSMR and, and GPRS radio systems and, and so on. So so the differences are not that fundamental. And and I would I would like to leave the, the class B discussion completely out of the country. Because I, I just said I don't see this as a topic in Australia, and I think it would just confuse people if we try to introduce that unnecessarily. <coughs> yeah. yeah. But 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 I I I, 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 I think that every every uh, city or every railway that has ETCS applications, they will have some kind of reference design, which hopefully, fingers crossed, will be consistent in that railway authority across that railway authority. 
so that you basically say, well, all the ETCS level two in Brisbane in the future will look <coughs> the same as it looks on the first line. And all the ETCS level two in Sydney will look the same anywhere in, in Sydney. So, so that would be an important thing. And it does require some discipline. That's, that's not, again, that's not coming automatic. So you will need to be stringent there and you will say, well, this is the reference design for ETCS level two in Sydney that we keep applying on all the different lines in Sydney where we install ETCS level two. Um, you will probably have uh, some kind of a test bench for that. So firstly, to make sure that the application is compliant with ETCS standards, because if it's not, then you will have inevitably problems with other authorities. And also to make sure that an onboard system coming from somewhere else can be tested against that tra this, this test bench. Yeah. And, and then the, the approach that Jean-Francois mentioned, the requirement for the onboard system to correct any yes. issues, well, any, any misinterpretations, I think that's the way to go. I think this is in line with the original philosophy of ETCS, which says that the trackside applications have the country specific, say, accents. Mm -hmm. And the onboard system, in theory, should have the entire functionality and should be capable to operate everywhere. Everywhere. That didn't like happen like this in practice for all the for all the logical reasons. <coughs> Suppliers didn't have all the money to implement 100% of the functionality. It was never required because some suppliers didn't operate in certain countries. So, but now the requirement is to have a really comprehensive onboard system. And if there are cases where it's not fully compliant or it doesn't <coughs> have certain features, it needs to go back and re-implement those things. Yeah. Yes, and that, that's yeah. exactly aligned with. Uh, it's perfectly aligned with the UK uh, uh, topic we mentioned <coughs> before, except that uh, I, I think your approach remains uh, quite a valid one. It's um, it's not only one GB reference design for the whole Australia, Australian country. It's multiple GB <laughs> reference designs, which will then become interoperable between each other with, yes. a, with a core a core implementation. Yes, 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 yes. Because, because I, I can't I can tell you straight away because we've seen it in the past. There was a very strong resistance for the interstate network to implement mm. ETCS because of affordability. Because they said, well, mm -hmm. we, we cannot afford <coughs> for a railway line where I have 500 kilometers of straight railway line where it takes me like two days to get to a certain point for maintenance reasons and so on. I cannot afford a full blown ETCS level two to the extent that we have it in a, in a dense city railway where I need high capacity, 24 trains an hour, something like that. So, so you will have to, if the interstate network ever went to ETCS, you will have to find an application which is very much stripped down to the minimum, reducing equipment as much as possible, all, all kinds of things, which will <coughs> inevitably look very, very different from the applications in cities. Yeah, so, so I'm yeah. with Jean-Francois that the suburban application should look similar when it comes to functionality, but then you still have the historic differences between Queensland yeah. and Victoria and, and New South Wales. But the, the, the biggest difference will clearly be between the city networks and the interstate network. And, and you, you've got to have, you can't force one solution onto the other side that would never work. But, but if you can basically have different reference designs <laughs> that can still be made interoperable via an onboard system that can cover everything. I think that's that's the way to go. And and I I was hoping for for you as the specialist on that topic in in Europe to to kind of confirm this. Yes, that's the way to go. Or no, 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 that's completely wrong. We need to do something entirely different. No? But, uh, I confirm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead. You, 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 talk, you talk about uh, affordability. And uh, in, in Europe, there is also a, a push for 
let's say, uh, a simplification of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, because, for example, some functionalities that probably at the beginning were requested by a, <clears throat> a specific country or a specific supplier or operator, or I don't know, now it is planned to abandon them because they are not used or, uh, or nearly not used. And so uh, this will simplify the system. This will make it uh, less expensive. Another example is uh, in baseline four, uh, level two and level three were merged. So it's a bit uh, a, a step in the way of uh, simplification. Well, this doesn't prevent the system from adding new features, but uh, at least it's it's a bit of a more rational approach, I would say. The the thing is that uh, the, the these these improvements that you just mentioned or these simplifications, I would imagine they will be quite incremental. So you may save, I don't know, half a percent here and one percent there and another half a percent over there. So so if I look at the interstate network, I would see the necessity of reducing cost in a very different ballpark. I would say at least 50 percent, probably <coughs> more than that. So so you basically need to come up with something right from scratch, which looks significantly different than the stuff that you have in the in the big cities. Yeah. So, so one one example that I heard from uh, from Switzerland is the whole topic of limited supervision, where yes. you can mm. simplify significantly the entire design process, the entire testing process, the necessity of having data inputs available all the time, and all these kind of things. So, so this is the kind of ballpark where 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 we need to to look at. I but, I believe. But, yeah. Um, a lot of countries follow this this uh, path. In fact, mm. they, it's not only Switzerland. Uh, it was like um, we we have seen this uh, clearly in the presentation of a last era uh, uh, workshop. Um, Switzerland paved paved pave the way, but not only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this limited supervision is was uh, seems to be the key to to deploy smoothly the process. In fact, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen it. I've seen it in in Switzerland. I was I was still in Europe when when they basically kicked off their program of rolling out limited supervision and and so so they developed a, a much simplified uh, signal system which was much cheaper, much more uh, modular. Uh, a simplified line side electronic unit, which was a lot cheaper than the full blown one with all the functionality. Mm. They, they even implemented a, a, a reduced functionality Belize, which was only at a half the price or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's these types of concepts that are really necessary when you cannot afford the full thing. I mean, it's one thing that you said, ah, it would be nice to save some cost. I, yes, I want some some full-blown ETCS system with full supervision, but I, I still want to save some cost. That's one thing. But if you say, I there's no way I can afford a full-blown ETCS, I've got to have something which is significantly cheaper, you have no choice. You've, you've got to come up with, with something which is drastically cheaper. All right, I'm, but, I'm conscious yes. I'm conscious of the time we, we took longer than I expected. My apologies for that. I hope you're not missing your next three meetings. Uh, I guess <laughs> I guess with all the different stakeholders and working groups in Europe, you must be extremely busy. Um, I enjoyed this conversation very, very much. I hope that the listeners learned a lot, especially hoping for people from Australia who are currently in the thick of things um, thinking about how interoperability can be pursued and achieved in Australia, that we can take some lessons learned and, uh, well, don't be surprised if you get an email from Australia anytime soon and say, well, I could, I could use some help here or some advice here or something like that. So, so thank you very much, Xavier. Thank you very much, Jean-Francois, for your time. And, um, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we will, we will stay in touch to, to keep me updated on the latest and greatest of ETCS interoperability. <laughs> sure. Thank you. It's always a pleasure if we can do that. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. It was a pleasure. Thank you very okay. much. Bye bye, thank everyone. You, bye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, this is Doc Frank again. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Xavier and Jean-Francois. Just a quick reminder of the Black Friday discount, 24% off of all my training courses by simply applying the coupon code BF24 on anything that you find on the training portal docfranktraining.podia.com. Thank you very much for listening and if you enjoyed it, please share and tell your friends about it. See you next time.